Hello guys, Colonel Mini here. Today's video is a tribute to just two of the millions of young men who served their countries during World War II. And one of the men was my father who joined the British Army. And the other young man was his very best friend, Peter Slater. Both men would serve their countries, my father fighting the Japanese in Burma, whilst Peter flew missions over Germany in a Lancaster bomber. And throughout 1943 and 44, they corresponded frequently, my father being regarded as an honorary member of the Slater family. Tragedy would befall both men before the end of the war. And the biggest factor for Peter came in August of 1944. Up to this point, Bomber Command conducted its operations mainly at night. But at night it was always difficult to find the target and the results were never guaranteed. And now with greater air supremacy by the long-range fighters, Bomber Command elected to start daylight bombing runs on August the 27th. So let's go back now to Monday the 20th of November 1944. Yes, and that's uh, Peter III from the left standing next to his pilot, Geoffrey France. And while the ground crews prepared the aircraft with armaments and fuel, the aircrew took an early lunch and then attended the pre-flight briefing. The briefing would have included current and uh, expected weather conditions during the period of the mission. This would include cloud layers and visibility, and the flight to and from the target was never direct. It always went around major flak concentrations and expected enemy aircraft intercepts. And based on all this information, pilot Jeff France and his navigator Fred Iceberg planned meticulously to create this, which is the actual flight plan used on that day. The route takes them across the North Sea to Bruges, where they turn onto the second leg and third leg, which takes them to the Rhine River. And from there they would head straight southeast to the target area at Homburg. If they were unable to bomb the primary target at Duisburg, then they would have turned north to Munster as a secondary target, and then gone home from there. So what exactly was the target that France and his crew would risk their lives for? It was the Gewerkschaft Rheinprussen Synthetic Oil Fischer Kops plant at Homburg. It was by no means a new target, and in July of 44 the RAF had completely destroyed it. That was the beauty of precision bombing, but since then the Germans had rebuilt it and got it functioning. And this is precisely why Air Vice Marshal Harris of Bomber Command advocated area bombing. This would destroy the population base and not allow any rebuilding of the primary targets. Harris was much criticized for this, but many believe that it helped to shorten the war in Europe. Irregardless, the top brass at Bomber Command decided that Monday's target would be the refinery. Peter was new to this crew. This crew had already flown 28 missions towards the coveted 30 missions. There was little likelihood of being intercepted by fighters, but flak was always a problem. There was, as usual, a cheerful bravado, but deep down they were all scared to death. And as an air gunner, Peter would have been assigned to either the uh, twin 303s on the top turret, or the quad 303s on the tail. And here the gunner climbs up to his top turret. And what a panoramic view he would have had. And one needed some agility to get into either gun position. So if it's that awkward to get into the position, imagine trying to get out in a hurry. The four Merlin engines were started up Each one was checked independently. And uh, Lancaster Juliet India Golf, a 514 squadron, taxied into position, awaiting takeoff clearance. 
they got the green light and off they went into the wild grey yonder. And the worst part would have been the waiting to get there. The waiting to see if you'd live or die. They encountered no enemy fighters en route. But the flak was going to be nasty. They released their ordnance, hit their targets, and then set course for home. Only one Lancaster failed to return from that mission. It was seen to explode over the target. There were no survivors. But thankfully, it was not Peter's aircraft that went down. For the rest of the squadron and Peter's crew, they could chalk up another successful mission. They would all be looking forward to a nice hot shower, a good meal, and then being able to sleep the stress of the day away in a nice warm bed. Meanwhile, my father was having a hell of a time in Burma. He was with the British 2nd Division of the 14th Army fighting the Japanese. In early 1944 he had fought at the Battle of Kohima, which is a small town in northeast India. This single battle lasted over two months, and British casualties amounted to about 4,000. And as an army medic, my dad would have been in the thick of things. And round about the time when Peter and his crew returned from their mission to Germany, my father's divisions were preparing to slog it out yet again with the Japanese at Mandalay and Mactila. And that Monday night when Peter climbed between the sheets of his warm bed and a full stomach, my father slept in the mud as the monsoon season struck with a vengeance. Neither young man could possibly understand what the other was going through at the time. The following day, 514 Squadron was told their job was not done. They had to go back again to the Homburg refinery and finish it off. So they refueled, rearmed, replanned, and set about doing it all over again.
to the refinery. 514 Squadron lost three aircraft. It's a flak. Peter Slater's aircraft was hit in one engine, which caused a fire and made the aircraft uncontrollable. As the aircraft plummeted to the earth, it disintegrated, throwing the pilot and the navigator clear. The rest of the crew were trapped inside, unable to get out due to the forces on the aircraft. For them, it would have been a terrifying few minutes before the final impact. And at 3.18, the aircraft crashed into the waterway surrounding the Guild Hall at Moors, a few kilometers from the target. Of the other two Lancasters that went down, one was lost with all the crew, and the other managed to land in Allied territory. But Peter, my father's best friend, was dead. He was 25. Jeff France and Fred Eisenberg were both captured and remained POWs throughout the war. Although Jeff France had his right leg amputated as a POW, both men survived the war and lived into old age. Many such events and exploits are covered well in Luck and the Lancaster by Harry Yates. The crew members of both aircraft that were shot down that day are buried in a communal grave at the Reichswald Forest War Cemetery near Moors. And in September of this year, I had the opportunity to visit the grave site and pay my respects. But what reason would I have to travel all the way to Germany to visit the grave site of a man that I'd never met who was not family? And the answer is because my father named me Peter after Peter Slater. So I felt the need to connect and pay my respects. For me, it was a very sobering experience to see 7,000 young Allied airmen in this tiny little cemetery amongst thousands of cemeteries in the area. You see, my father was never able to visit Peter's grave and pay his respects. He was filled with such grief and agony that he could never go back and see the Slater family again. In the modern world that would be called PTSD and labeled as survivor guilt. I believe the war affected my father so much that he was always in survival mode even in civilian life right through until he died in 2006. We all enjoy the fun and excitement of playing our video games, but let's just keep war as a game. As always, thanks for watching guys, and if you've enjoyed my content, then please subscribe. Cheers.